your Bibles tonight, I want you to go to the book of Proverbs chapter 27. I want to talk tonight from a, from a couple passages of scripture, Proverbs chapter 27 and then Jeremiah chapter 17. And uh, I'm going to deal with something tonight that's probably going to be one of the toughest things I've ever dealt with. Um, but I think that it is needful at this time in our church. And um, so we're going to talk, talk from these two passages of Scripture. And I'm going to cover a lot of ground tonight. I'm going to bounce around the Bible, so get everybody get ready. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then he asked the question, Who can know it? Tonight I'm going to talk about the power of deception. The power of deception. And I know that for everybody that's here, you may say we're not deceived, but we probably have people that are here that have been deceived, that you don't know you were deceived. That is the power of deception. You don't know it. Okay. Um, not only people that are here, but maybe those that are watching over social media will understand that the enemy loves to deceive. That's his weapon, is deception. Okay? And so I want to start off tonight by talking about that. You know, I was thinking this week as a pastor uh, throughout the years, sometimes I'm led to prepare sermons uh, that are meant to take the church in a certain direction for a certain season. In other words, when I get up, when, when the year turns in January, I always give myself a personal uh, agenda for that year. This is where I want to take the church this year. In January, I started talking about, I want to take this church back to holiness this year. And I've been preaching toward those kind of uh, lines or... or um, Places and I and that's certainly where I want to go. So sometimes I prepare sermons to that toward that. Other times I prepare sermons and warning to the very people that God has placed under my ministry. So in other words, I see something going on. I need to warn them about it on a personal level. Somebody just in a personal situation that needs to be warned. Then there's times when I look at the church as a whole, and as a whole I see the enemy trying to devour or to divide the sheepfold, it's in those times when I'm led to preach towards certain sins or spirits that I see attacking members of the church. That is my position as a pastor. I am, according to the Bible, the watchman upon the wall. I'm the one that's got the trumpet in his hand, and I am supposed to blow the trumpet when I see the enemy come. When you go to the book of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah's rebuilding the things that the enemy has torn down, when they, when they have been taken off into Babylonian captivity, and he comes back to rebuild the city. The, the temple of the Lord has been already rebuilt. Now, to protect that temple, he has to build walls and rebuild the gates. And we know that he does it out of a rubbish pile. He takes the burnt stones out of that pile. He takes and puts them stones back where they were in that wall, and he rebuilds that wall. The reason he rebuilds the wall is for protection so that no enemy can come into the house of God. 
The temple was unguarded with those walls down, those gates burnt with fire. Anything could come in, anything could go out. So he really felt in his heart, I need to get those walls built. In fact, he was so moved that the Bible says he took years off from serving in the palace of Shushan to build those walls, to do what God had called him to do. It was a passion. And it so moved him that the king of Shushan saw this countenance change in him to the point that the king gave him the right to leave Shushan, stop being a slave or a servant to him or a cupbearer to him, and to go back to Jerusalem. And on his journey, he writes him letters to get wood or anything else he would need to rebuild those walls or those gates. When Nehemiah gets back, <clears throat> one of the ways that he built, he understood that the enemy was standing right around Jerusalem. Those enemies was making fun of Nehemiah as they built. They were taunting Nehemiah. They were telling him, come down off that wall, stop building, become one of us, become mundane, just adapt. They were trying to deceive him to make him think that the call of God that was on his life was not sent by God himself. Nobody's going to bother the temple. Just leave it alone. We need no walls. We need no gates. But the reality was is that Nehemiah knew what God had spoke to him. Now stay with me. Nehemiah knew what God had spoke to him. The word of the Lord was more powerful than the word of Sanballat or Tobiah, those enemies of him building that wall. So Nehemiah constructed that wall, and as he's constructing it, he does something very unique. He put men around the base of that, or, or the, the, the height of that wall. They were towers in that wall. And he put men over, over those towers. And those men's job was, ever so many feet, those men were placed with a trumpet in their hand. And every time that they would see the enemy approaching that wall to stop the work of God, as a whole in Jerusalem or on a personal level, those men were to blow the trumpet. When they blow the trumpet, it was significant for everybody to leave the building of the wall and come to that area of where the trumpet sounded and fight the enemy. Now listen to me very closely. There are things that goes on in church that we need to leave our personal agenda to come and help fight for the betterment of the church. Everybody understand that? There are things that we need to bring together. We need to come together and unite in the fight. The enemy is not going to always climb up on the wall where you are. The enemy is not going to always climb the wall where I am or where Pastor Jay is. But wherever he comes, understand that if he comes through somebody in their personal life that is on that wall helping build or attending that church, it is not an attack on that person personally. It is an attack of the enemy trying to get in that wall through whatever weakness he can use to get to that church and destroy that house of God. Understand that Sam Ballot and Tobiah, the very enemies of Nehemiah, did not want him rebuilding that wall because they wanted to control the condition of the church. They wanted to destroy the worship out of it. They wanted to control what was going on in the house of God. That house of God, Nehemiah thought, is worth protecting. Can I get an amen from anybody? Amen. It was worth protecting. So, as a trumpet blower, I, I'm, I'm talking tonight as a trumpet blower. There are times when I can look at the church as a whole, and I see the enemy trying to devour or divide that sheepfold. It's in those times when I'm led to preach toward those certain sins or those certain spirits that I see attacking members of the church. I'm wise enough to understand that the enemy cannot get in our church as a whole unless he comes through members. If I understand that. He targets members. He does not target the church as a whole. He targets members. If the enemy is coming up your part of the wall... Listen to me. And you are deceived that it is an enemy. And he gets in your part of the wall. His next attack is the church. He, it affects the body of Christ. 
I'm going to say something very strong and very stout. I want all of you to listen to me. Every choice you make as an individual affects this church. Whether you make it a good choice, a bad choice, a choice to live right, or a choice to sin, it affects this church. You can take one person, get them on fire for God, them praying, them seeking the Lord, them falling in love with the Lord again. It will affect this church because they will let it be known we will see that renewing of the Spirit of God in them, and it will affect the church, and it gives a hunger or causes a hunger for uh, from other people to jump in there and do the same thing. On the reverse side of that, you can allow one of us to fall into sin or deceitfulness and start listening to what our heart's telling us, and how many of y'all know it affects the whole church? It does, listen to me, if, if all it does is take our mind off of worship of the Lord when we're here, and we have our mind directed from on somebody's failure or somebody's sin or what somebody's choices are at that moment, the enemy has won what he tried to do to this church. If he gets us distracted, that's why I'm not distracted by something that may be going on in the church. I will handle that outside the pulpit. But our agenda is when we come in here, we lift up the name of the Lord. And if I be lifted up, Jesus said, I'll draw all those people that are deceived to me. He has the power to kill that sin in their life instantaneously, but they have to be able to get in the presence of God. And what the enemy knows is if he can get us focused on somebody's sin or somebody's choice or somebody's failure, what happens is he destroys us from getting in the presence of God, and that person never gets help. That makes sense to anybody. It's usually when it, when I when I prepare sermons to talk to somebody or to preach toward a certain sin or a certain spirit that might be in the church. It's usually in those times when members have become blind to what Satan is doing to devour them, to kill their testimony, to destroy their integrity, to strip them of their influence. And folks, that's going on every single day. The enemy ain't wanting you physically; he wants your integrity. He's not after you bodily. He wants your morals. He wants to kill your testimony. You know why? Because he knows the word of God that says we overcame by the blood of the Lamb. That's right. And the word of our testimony, listen to me, there ain't a thing that Satan can do about the blood of the Lamb. It's already been shed. The price has done been paid. You are saved by the blood. But you lose victory when he steals your testimony. You don't overcome if you stop talking about the goodness of God. Wow. I'm preparing a sermon right now that I'll probably preach Sunday morning if the Lord doesn't change my mind on the testimony that lives in you. And, and listen, the enemy knows if he can destroy your testimony, there is no power to overcome. So tonight I'm going to talk about a spirit that I see moving through our church. In fact, I, see it, I, I think it's a spirit of the wolf moving through the congregation and building his den in areas where he feels the most comfortable at. Listen to me. Everything goes the path of least resistance. Water flows the path of least resistance. The Spirit of God flows the path of least resistance, and so does the Spirit of the enemy. He does not attack people that are strong. A wolf has his characteristics is he attacks the young and he attacks the old and he attacks the weak. Are you hearing me? He does not come after the strong. The only way he gets in the sheepfold is he goes the path of least resistance and that spirit can, can build a den in those that he feels the most comfortable with. The closer you are to the enemy's camp, is the quicker he can come through you to get into our church. You have a responsibility, folks, every single one of us, and those that's listening by social media, to keep this church unspotted from the world and to keep it clean. And the enemy knows, I cannot attack that church as a whole, so I'm going to attack individuals in that church, and me attacking those individuals will affect the whole body. Eventually, if we don't do anything about those spirits of deception that have, that come to the church, the whole church can become deceived because of compromise. Everybody with me? Yeah. Or am I going too fast? All right. Some of us, 
in the church. I'm not saying you or me, or but some of us in the church have taken our eyes off the Lord, and we've become okay with still trying to go through the routines of the church, yet compromise in areas of what's right and wrong in the sight of God. How many of y'all ever went to, to somebody told you it was wrong and the first thing that popped out something was wrong and the first thing that popped out of your mind or into your mind was everybody's doing that. That can't really be wrong. Surely there's not... Man, how in the world is everything wrong? But this, this is nothing more than the spirit of deception overtaking our thoughts within our hearts. Listen, if the Bible is correct, and I believe it is in Jeremiah 17 where he says the heart is deceitful above all things, above all things, the heart is deceitful, right? Deception, according to the Greek, is the act of causing someone to accept as true or valid what is false and invalid. Deception is the trick of the enemy to entertain or to mislead or to misguide you from the will of God for your life. Any false spirit that speaks to you, God has a divine destiny for you, and it's according to the Word of God. Any, any spirit that speaks to you that removes you from that divine destiny and that tries to change what God has already said in His Word and to get you to compromise on that Scripture, you are no longer listening to the voice of the Lord. You are listening to a spirit of deception. Everybody understand that? Amen. Everybody say it. A spirit, a spirit of deception. The Bible says, listen to me, I'm going to get real serious real quick. The Bible says in the last day church, take heed that no man deceive you. That no man, that's a warning of Jesus. Jesus spoke in himself. There is coming a day, the Bible said, Jesus said, when men will rise to try to deceive you. Listen to me. Guess who he said would arise? False prophets, preachers, teachers, having each and ears. Men will come in, creep in unaware, lead silly women astray. How? Through deception. In other words, how are they going to do it? Notice that everybody he, that Jesus warned would rise in that last day to be deceivers would be men that take the word of God and twist the word of God. You know what he was saying? There is a spirit behind that. And what happens is that spirit of deception takes what's, what is true and valid and makes it untrue and unvalid to your mind and your heart. And you start manipulating the word of God to twist it. If Jesus gave us commandment to take heed that no man coming in the form of a prophet, a teacher, a preacher, nobody... Don't let them deceive you. If Jesus said it that strong, how much more is it a reality that we can be deceived by our own thoughts, our own reading of the Word of God? When you try to make the Word of God say something it does not, you are being influenced by a spirit of deception. I'm going to talk about that in depth right here in a minute. Understand that deception is a trick of the enemy. One of the writers of the New Testament, I read about 50 scriptures today about deception. One of the writers of the Old Testament said that deception is like a bird caught in a snare. In other words, you're in a cage. You can't get out. And here's what happens with deception. Once you are deceived and you give in to that deception, it is easier the next time for you to be deceived and the next time for you to be deceived and the next time for you to be deceived until what God has said to you means nothing to you. So now you have compromised the Word of God so much in your life that you know to do good, but do it not is what? Sin unto you, the Bible said. So I read the Word of God, and I know His standards, and I know His holiness, and I know what He wants for our life, and there is no, there is no gray area of that. It is black and white. There's no gray area. But because I want to my, what I want in my heart, I compromise the Word of God and I take that and begin to twist it. Did God really say that? Is that what He really meant? And before long, I have become deceived and a spirit of deception is driving me. You said, Preacher, how can I come to church being deceived? Listen, my friend, 
There is a lot of church people that sit in churches every single Sunday and the whole congregation is the same. Jesus warned us again, take heed that no man deceive you. I spoke the other night about Jim Jones, over 900 people. He talked into drinking Kool-Aid. You know why? Because of a spirit of deception. They were deceived that if they died in suicide, God was going to take them to heaven. Right? We know that's not true, according to the Word of God. We know that they were deceived by a man that they thought was Jesus Christ can't come in the flesh again. Right? Basically, that spirit of deception started by one soul, one heart, turning at a time. Then it went from one to two, all the way up to 900-something people that died there. The Bible says in the last days, in that last day church age, if you look at the church of Laodicea, there's seven churches in the, in the book of Revelation. Those seven churches are the seven churches of Asia. The Apostle Paul said that not only are they seven churches, I personally believe it is seven church ages that we would go through from the time that Jesus died on the cross and started the church at Pentecost until the coming of the Lord. And if that is correct, you can look it through history and see where they line up. But the church of Laodicea is the church age we are in right now. And that last church age, one of the marks of that is that the church of Laodicea is a church age of total deception. Total deception. Here's where they're deceived at. You have a name that you're rich. You're without nothing. You don't want anything. But you have been deceived because you are blind, poor, naked, and miserable. God says you have an outward appearance. You, you think in your own mind that all is well, but that last church age is totally deceived. We see it right now on the world, the church world agenda of how many thousands are deceived right now by false prophets. And it don't have to be somebody that gets up and declares, I'm a false prophet. He, false prophets never declare they are false. But they do prophesy false things. And men run after their ministries. And they'll chase their ministries only to find out when it's all said and done. Now, God begins to bring down prophets that their heart, listen to me, that started off good has now been deceived. And now they're walking in deception, but they have become so big in the ministry that they cannot admit they are deceived. Neither do they even know they are deceived. They are blind to this spirit of deception. And here's what happens. While congregations are turning out to them, those congregations do not understand that everything reproduces after its own kind. The spirit of deception that's in the man goes to that congregation, right. and they become as deceived as he is. Now they're all on a path to hell with a spirit of deception and do not know it. The Bible says uh, uh, that the very first time that we see the spirit of deception, I'm going to talk from the book of Genesis for just a moment. The very first time we see this spirit of deception and the effects of this spirit is in the very garden of Eden at the very first man and first woman that God ever created. The Bible says this, listen to this. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, this snake said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. Has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, listen to me, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you, you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. Did you see what he done? He took the very word of God that was right, correct, without blemish, and he twisted what God had said. He says to the woman, you shall not surely die. Listen to this. For God 
does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and he and you shall be as the gods, knowing good and evil. You know what he's saying to her? I'm going to twist the word of God enough for you to open your eyes and your heart up to a spirit of deception. And here's the deception, that you're the God of your own life. You'll be the God, and God will no longer be. You'll be like the gods to know good and evil. You'll be like the gods to control your life. You'll be like the gods to chase what you want. You will not worry about what God's word says anymore or the path of righteousness that he wants you to walk or the lifestyle of holiness. You will compromise in this spirit of deception so much that you become your own God. Do you know that right now the greatest false doctrine that has hit the modern day Laodicean church comes through men of great admiration in the world's church system that they every one of their doctrines, every single one of their doctrines is that you are gods. You are. They preach it to their congregation. Every book they write says it. Their base doctrine is that you become gods. And when you become gods, you can say what you want to and it'll happen. You can have the agenda of your own life. You can guard or guide your own life. Whatever you say will happen. And I'm telling you, that is deceitful. That is a spirit of deception. Listen, folks, we don't need your word. We have his. We don't need you to write another thing of, I'm going to live this way. God's word tells us how to live. And here's my first sermon on the spirit of deception. I'm going to pick this up next, uh, next Wednesday night. Listen to me. The spirit, the greatest spirit of deception is when it comes to what God says in his word. Right. Period. God said it. His word, according to the Bible, is forever settled in heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my word will stand forever. Right. What am I going to be judged by? I'm going to be judged by the word of God. So when I stand before the Lord, it ain't going to matter what my heart said. It won't matter what my heart wanted. It won't matter what my own personal desires was. When this book is open right here, I'm going to be judged by according to what the Word of God said. He's not going to change it for me. He's not going to twist it for me. He's not going to try to maneuver it for me to, to meet my lifestyle or my agenda God said it, it's settled forever in heaven, and that's what we're going to be judged by. The deception was against what God had told them in his word. The deception's motive was to destroy them from their paradise garden. Now listen to this. It was to separate them from walking with God. I'm going to, I'm going to make a strong statement. If you try to justify your life, by twisting scripture, you have broke fellowship with God. Right. Don't tell me God's still with you, because I don't believe it. When, when, you, when you do that, you break fellowship. Preacher, listen to me. One of the greatest deceptions going on. God will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. You ever heard that scripture? Oh, yeah. Twist it and make it to the word. You can sin and you can have fall into a lifestyle, and it doesn't matter how you live and see how, how quick God walks away from you. Because that text is not fulfilled until you put it with the other text, and here's what the other text says. As, if you follow him, he'll never leave you. If you're right with him, he'll stay with you. But there's a scripture in the Old Testament where God said, if you did, if you Reject me, I'll reject you. You leave me, I'll leave you. It is all contingent. If you're going to read the Word of God, that's why you cannot take one verse out of the Scripture and use it for any doctrine. Right. It has to be line on line, precept upon precept. And if you do that by taking one Scripture, you twist the Word of God, what it says. Right. You can listen, folks. You cannot, you cannot walk in a spirit of deception and have fellowship with God. God drove them from the garden. Guess where he was walking? Listen to me. 
I have heard all my life that God walked in the cool of the day in the garden. But if you read the text, this is what the text really says. The word of God, the voice of the Lord God, the word of God, walked with Adam in the cool of the day. The word of God was walking with Adam. The word. And as long as Adam was in agreement with that word, as long as his life lined up to that word, they had fellowship. But the very moment that Eve believed what the serpent said and believed the spirit of deception and the twisting of Scripture, they lost that fellowship, and the Bible said God drove them out of the garden. Right. And guess what, folks? He didn't go with them. He shut the gate of that garden. He put cherubims, listen to me, on the outside with holding flaming swords to protect the entrance of that garden, so they can never come back into that garden. There is no recorded text anywhere in the scripture where Adam ever went back through that east gate. In fact, right on the outside of that east gate, they built an altar, Adam did, where Cain and Abel came to the gate and came to the altar, but they were never allowed to go back in. They could look in the garden, but they could not fellowship with God anymore. So apparently Adam had taught them about God, so they built an altar and they brought it to the brought their fruit and their sheep and all the stuff that they had, was going to sacrifice to God. They brought it to the altar, but standing outside the presence of God. You know what kept them outside the presence of God? The spirit of deception when it come to God's word. God said, "You want to control your own life? You want to be your own gods? I'll let you be." But you're going to do it outside my presence. And listen, folks, the most dangerous thing you can do is to justify where you are and the decisions you're making and still believe in a spirit of deception that you are okay. You can, you can play musical instruments. You can get behind a pulpit and preach. You can be on the deacon board. You can teach Sunday school. You can do anything in the church you want to do. And you can do it with a spirit of deception on you. And when it's over with, you'll stand before God and be judged according to the things that's written in the book. And you will be weighed in the balance and found that you are wanted. Right. You absolutely will not make it in to the kingdom of heaven. Because you're in deception. I am a personal believer that God's going to judge what we've done with the word of God more than he'll judge anything in our life. Because I'm going to tell you why. What we've done with the word of God determines what we do with our life. If I take this word of God for what it says, I hide it in my heart. Y'all remember being in whatever that was, uh, vacation Bible school when you go and they, the, the scripture they taught I'm going to take the word of God and hide it in my heart that I may not sin against God right so that word of God is put in my heart if I have the word of God in my heart it keeps me from sinning listen to me folks we are in a great spirit of deception when preachers get up and say that God done away with the law and we're not going to be judged according to the law. That is a lie. That is deception. God never done away with the law. He fulfilled the law with Christ. Listen to me. But the day of judgment, we're going to be judged according to the law. He did not do away with the law. The law of God, the Bible said, is a good law. It holds men accountable to the holiness of God. It holds us in a position where we should live right and tells us what we should live according to. The Apostle Paul himself, the greatest preacher of the New Testament, said, I did not know sin was sin until I heard the law of God preached. When I heard the law of God preached, sin revived in me. In other words, it became alive in me that I was sinning against God. And when I heard that law, sin revived and I died out for that sin. The law is what makes you stop sinning. Everybody understand that? The law guides you. So when you, when you, what am I supposed to do with my personal life? Pick up the book. Pick up the book. Read the law of God. How am I supposed to treat my neighbor? Pick up the book. Deuteronomy will tell you. How am I supposed to act in business? 
pick up the book, Deuteronomy, I'll tell you. There is a law given, a social law. How am I supposed to act out in public? Pick up the book and read the book. The first five books of the Bible will tell you how a child of God should walk. Here's the difference. Now that I'm in the New Testament, God doesn't do away with the law, but he gives me the Spirit of God to help me fulfill my walk of the law. He doesn't do away with the law, folks. The same laws that he gave to Jewish men years and years ago about their dress code or about how they approached the temple or how still is in effect today. Now, that's not popular because we don't like that. But if you go to Israel, they still live according to the law. You know why? Because they count that law as being holy and just as much holy and as much just as the God that gave that law. And we have compromised that. We have compromised it because we don't want anybody judging us. We'll run around and get tattoos. Nobody can judge me but God. We'll get shirts made. Nobody can judge me but God. That's a lie. That's a lie. But wouldn't it be enough if only God is going to judge us for us to live better? That scares the living daylights out of me. I'd rather Kathy judge me. I'd rather Sister Shirley judge me and condemn me if she wants to. Then God to judge me. You know why? Because he's judging me from a holy standard. He's judging me from a, a, a person that, that knew no sin and lived in the flesh. And how am I going to stand before him and say, but I lived in the flesh. My excuse is I'm in the flesh. He's just going to look back and say, so was I. But I was spotless. I didn't sin. Right? The deception found in that Garden of Eden was against what God had told them in his words. The deception's motive. I want you out of the garden. It's going to break that garden experience. Do you realize that when Adam was put in the garden, he never planted one thing? He never worked? There was no bad smells in the garden. There was no trees where the bark was busted and falling off. There was no wiltering flowers. Everything was coming up because God said it. Let it be. There was light in the garden. Then everything in that garden was prepared by the word of God. And that's what Satan uses for our greatest deception. He's in that garden. He's not having to work. Everything's peaceful. And all of a sudden, he decides to let deception come in. When he allows deception to come in, guess what? He gets thrown out into an earth that is void. Darkness on the face of the earth. He's thrown out into the place where God's saying, listen, you didn't want to be in the garden no longer. You wanted to be deceived. I'm going to throw you out of the garden where flowers are blooming and trees are producing fruit and you've got it made and rivers are flowing in that garden. You've got it made in that garden. You want to be deceived and accept that spirit. I'm going to show you what deception does. I'm going to throw you out of the garden. I'm going to cut, close the gate to the garden. And you are going to work in the thorns and the thistles of the earth. You know why we go through times in our life where it seems like we're getting stuck on every hand? And it's hard labor. And why is it so hard on me? And why is life treating me this way? And why in the world am I suffering like I'm suffering? And why can't I get a relationship to work? You know why? You chose deception. You're allowing the spirit of deception to rule you. You're trying to maneuver around what God said and stay in the garden. But you can't. Because God, there's a scripture in the Bible where God says, a man with a deceitful heart cannot stand in front of me. I read it today. He moves them out of, the, out of his sight. Am I, am I too strict? I'm saying this, I'm teaching this for your good. That deception, that motive of deception was to separate them from walking with God, to throw them out of the garden. And it was to make the word of God void to them. Let me prove something. And this is nowhere in my notes. How many of y'all can remember what I preached Sunday morning? 
What I preached at you? Two people raised their hands. Do you see how Satan does? But I'll bet you you can remember what happened at work today. Or I'll bet you you can remember a conversation this week you've had with a friend that, or, a, or an enemy that you didn't like. But you can't remember the word of God. Do you know that there is a parable of the sower and the seed in the New Testament? And Jesus warned us, a sower went out to sow seed. And he sowed it. Some fell on stony ground, and some fell in the thorns and the thistles, and some fell on good ground, and some fell where the birds of the air flew in, the demon spirits flew in and got the seed. Notice that all that happened to the seed of the Word of God. That's why when Sunday morning comes, you don't remember it. You know why? Because sitting in church service, going through the routine of having church, here comes that demon spirit and subtracts the seed of the word of God out of you. Why? So you can be deceived that week. If the seed of the word of God is in you, you may not be deceived. If that seed takes root and springs up in good ground, you might live that week right with God, fearing the wrath of that word that's to come if you break it. If you break it. It was to make the word of God void to them. As if God had never said it. We're, listen, the Bible says where the, where the word of a king is, there is power. If there is power where the word of a king is, what about what happens when there is no word of a king? There is no power. So Satan steals the word out of you, so there's no power for you to overcome the enemy. We're all, listen to me, we're Pentecostal people. You know what we do? We make a mistake. We run crazily after the Holy Ghost until we speak in tongues. But we don't run after the Word of God like that. We don't sit down and listen to me. We, we'll, we'll, Lord, I want that Holy Ghost so I can buck and shout and holler and squall. And people will know I got it. But we don't read 15 chapters a day. We don't sit down with the Word of God and search out a text until we've exhausted it. We don't go through something. We're dependent on the Spirit of God. Listen to me. Listen to me. The Spirit of God does not work unless it has the Word of God to work with it. Do you get that? The Spirit of God, the only power that Spirit of God has is where the Word of God is effective. Where the Word of a king is, there is what? Power. That Spirit of God is the power. But where there is no word, there is no power. And you can run around and shake your hands and jump up and down and go through the emotions and go home and live in depression and discouragement and have the enemy to wipe the floor with you because there is no word in you. If you want the Spirit of God's power to be enacted, you have got to put the word of God in you. And you've got to believe the word for what it says. You can't compromise and say, I read that, but I don't believe that's what it means. It means exactly what it says. You, if I get that. But they, they, they were, listen to me. Adam and Eve was immediately, I didn't want to take this long tonight, but Adam and Eve were immediately plunged in a deception of sin because they disobeyed the word of God. His word doesn't change. And, 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 and it's not going to change for you or for me. We act like God. This blows my mind. I've done it and you've done it. And we've got some in our churches doing it right now. We act like God will be okay with decisions that we make in our life because he has mercy. Oh, God will forgive me. I'll do what I want to do and then he'll forgive me. I'll just run to the altar in front of everybody. Since everybody's worried about the decisions I'm making, I ask God to forgive me, and I'll get up, and they'll cry, and they'll weep, and go on, and then it'll be like it never happened. It's not true, folks. A trip to the altar does not wipe out a decision of sin in your life. You, you need to hear that. There are, reper, there, there are repercussions of sin in your life. If you don't believe that, sit down with me and talk to me, 
And I'll tell you some mistakes I've made in my past where I am paying for it 30-something years later because there are repercussions of decisions that you've made. God will be all right with it because he has mercy. How many of y'all know that there are some sins recorded in the Bible where God says, I'm not forgiven? Blaspheme of the Holy Ghost. Listen to me. Which includes pushing away of his spirit when it asks you to submit to his word. He won't forgive blaspheme of the Holy Ghost in this life or the life to come. He will not forgive unforgiveness. If you won't forgive, he won't forgive you. And if you die with unforgiveness, you are going to hell. I don't care if you if you sing Amazing Grace better than anybody can sing it. You are going to bust hell wide open because of unforgiveness. You better get it free right now. You better get it clean. You know anybody that's done you wrong and you've got that. Uh, every time you see them, it's, oh my God, I'm about to drive my fist through the back of their throat. I know how what that feels like. You better get it free because if you die which could happen anytime. If you die, you're going to stand before God and Him saying, I couldn't forgive you. I would have had you just forgave. That's all I want you to do. If you forgive, if you'd, if you'd kill your pride long enough to go to that person and say, listen, if I've done something to you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you know how easy that is to say? Everybody say it. I'm sorry. You know what? When it becomes hard, when you have a heart of unforgiveness toward the person you need to say it to. You just said it to me. Didn't have no problem saying it. I said it three or four times with no problem saying it. But you let somebody that's done something wrong to me say it, and God say, it, you better say it to them. Oh, man. Right? The spirit of deception listen to me folks, makes us believe that somehow we will get by with what we are doing wrong. It leads us to believe that God understands. There's a, there used to be an old song the Baptist, you say, God understands, he knows all about it. <laughs> and the same people believe once saved, always saved. It don't matter what you do after you get saved, you're going to heaven anyway, so God understands. God knows that there's an old country song, song out by Cal Smith back in the 50s. Yeah. God knows I've been drinking. And you know what, it is, what the whole song's about? It's about a, a woman that goes to church that caught him drinking. And he says, Sister so-and-so of the so-and-so church, God knows I've been drinking. As if God ain't going to judge him drinking. And that's the attitude of the world, listen to me, and I'm not worried about the attitude of the world. I'm worried about the attitude of some of our people in this church, in this congregation, that thinks that they can do things against the Word of God and still be okay. Still be on stage. Still be singing in the choir. Still be preaching. Still be whatever. Folks, we need to examine our life. And I'm talking from me to you to whoever's listening on social media in this church, and if we're going to take it back to holiness, we have to examine our life and come to the agreement of that God cares about what I do with my spirit, my soul, and my body. It causes us, deception does, to have an attitude that no one can judge me or my actions but God. It causes us to, to think, I don't care what other things that other people think of me. You ever heard that? I could care less what people think of me. What an attitude of deception. What an attitude. I promise you, you care. I promise you. You care. It causes us to, listen, this is the greatest one, I think. The spirit of deception causes us to damage our family and our church because of our own heart's desires. Your actions and my actions damage the church. It's amazing to me what we can't get that. We cannot comprehend that. When I'm making a decision 
that I think is only going to hurt me. I am a fool to think that. It's going to hurt the church. How many of y'all know I'm the pastor of this church and I can make the wrong decision and I can morally fall, right? And it get told to the church and it's going to affect you, right? Here's what's going to happen. The deacon board's going to get together. They're going to do it in secret. They're going to talk in secret, right? What should we do with pastors? He morally failed. I'm just telling you how it works. He morally failed. That, then they're going to then they're going to get the guts enough to come and talk to me. We need to talk to you. They're going to lay out accusations, right? They're going to tell me what was said. Here's what they never consider: how many innocent people that don't know is fixing to be destroyed, right? I have no way, when I make that choice to morally fail, I have no way of knowing who all is connected to me that's going to feel the effects of my choice. Right? I'm going to affect the church. We have over 500 members in this church. Did you know that? I'm going to affect the 500 members if they ain't been here in five years. As soon as they hear it, he failed. Guess what they done? The deacon board threw him out. They didn't get on the altar and pray with him. They didn't show him mercy. They didn't stand him back up. They didn't stand beside him and hold his arms up in his trying time. They got rid of him. Right? Then here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get bitter. I'm going to hate the church. I'm going to hate the deacon board. I'm going to hate the people that, right? All the innocent people is gonna, it, that's going to be affected. Then what it's going to do, I'm going to seclude myself. I ain't talking to none of you when it's over. Right? I'm telling you how the enemy is. It all starts with the spirit of deception. Then what it's going to happen is, my daughter's going to see me do that. She's going to end up hating the church because the church turned it on me. She ain't going to love the deacons that, that, that came to me and threw me out without having mercy. She's going to look at her daddy that's hurt. Guess what? On my side. She's going to lose confidence in the ministry. It's not only going to affect her, it's going to affect the guy she's with. If she has children 10 years down the road, she's going to tell them the story. You know, your grandfather used to be a pretty powerful preacher. But he morally failed. And the church cut his throat when he did it. And now, through the spirit of deception, one man being deceived to fall into moral failure... It has affected everybody that is in contact with it. Am I talking too straight? That's where it's going. That, that's what happens with deception. There's no end to it. It, dece it, 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 it. it deceives us into being led by our heart, listen to me, instead of the Holy Spirit and His Word. I'm going to talk for just a minute and I'll close. I want to talk about the heart for a minute. Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Wicked. Go ahead, say it. My heart's wicked. Come on, happen. My heart is wicked. I already know that. You know how I know that? Jeremiah told me. He was inspired of the Holy Ghost to tell me that my heart is deceitful above all things and it is desperately wicked. Well, I'm, I think I'm a good guy. You're under deception. You, you see what you just done? You took the word of truth and twisted it because of your own feelings. I try to do people right. I, my heart can't be that bad. See how easy it is? No. You believe in your heart is half wicked does not change the word of God that said it is a wicked above or deceited deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's the truth. My heart, Pastor Jody Darden's heart, is desperately wicked. If I don't have the Word of God in me, and, I don't be, and I'm not being led by the Spirit of God, by midnight tonight, I'll be doing some wicked, deceitful things. And so would you. Because when I walk out of church... And I close my Bible, right? My mind is human. And the enemy starts talking to my mind. And if I fall into the deceitfulness of that, 
I'm saying and doing the things I should not do. No wonder the Apostle Paul, after he saves them, the very things I tell the church not to do, I end up doing myself. What was he saying? He said, who is going to deliver me from the body of this death that I'm, I'm living in flesh that's capable of being deceived? Who's going to deliver me? And he goes on to say, there's a war in my members going on. When I would do good, evil is present with me. You, listen, folks. Every issue I've ever had as a pastor from a member coming to me for counseling or me watching them have, make bad choices or bad decisions that I know is Satan deceiving them for a terrible future. Every single one of them, I can take back and revert back to their heart is deceitful. Wicked. Their, their heart is wicked. That's the bedrock of our decisions. The one mistake you can make above all mistakes is for you to follow your heart. But I feel it in my heart that it's wicked. It's evil. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We are not led as believers by our heart. You hear me? We are led as believers by the word of God and driven by the spirit of God to follow that word. We are not supposed to be led by our heart. That's why we get into wrong relationships sometimes because we are led by our heart emotions of our heart instead of following the word of God and saying is this person good for me let me find out y'all looking at me like a, look at a cow looking at a new guy <laughs> but I just got to have that person I'm, I'm crazy I'm crazy about that person what's the word of God say what's this say turn the pages of it find out where do I find out if that person's meant for me? Right here. What kind of woman is it you're chasing? What kind of man is it your, your heart's in love with? What are we doing to stop the deceitfulness that comes in our heart? Folks, right now in our church, right now, I don't care to even say it. I could care less who, who, who I offend or make mad. Right now in our church, there is spirits of deception working right now with people's hearts. And I'm watching good men and good women that are that are that are caught up, that are Christians make wrong decisions and run after relationships that God said cannot happen. And they don't care. You know why? They're deceived. They're deceived. It doesn't make them bad people. They're deceived. They're overlooking what the Word of God said. They are not being driven by the Word of God and led by the Holy Spirit. They are literally being led by a heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Listen, I'm, I'm going to make this statement. It may not make sense to you. You have no idea. You, you don't even have the capability to know your own heart. Jeremiah asked the question, who can know it? It's not you. You don't have the capability of knowing your own heart. That's what Jeremiah said. I know my heart. But no, you don't. You're, you're lying and the word of God is true. You don't know your heart. And I'll tell you why you don't know your heart. Because if you, if, even in relationship, the relationship you think you know your heart in, what about the other five, six, seven relationships before them that you thought you knew your heart in? You don't. You can't know it. You know why? Because the heart changes. It becomes more wicked, more devilish more desperate the older you get. Who can 
know it. The greatest deception of all is the deception of the Word of God says something and how for me to live. And I don't care. But I'm going to say I'm a Christian anyway. You're deceived. You're deceived. I don't know how many will stand before the Lord one day and give an account of the things we've done in the flesh. I, I don't know. I'm going to say everybody, but I don't know what that number would be. But I will tell you this, that literally every single time that I am in a service where I feel like the God, that God spoke to me and to tells me to do something, when that word of God comes to me, I never check my heart. I check my spirit. Because my heart will have me doing emotional things in the church that is a thousand miles away from the Spirit of God or the Word of God. I check. Here's what I do. I do it every single time. When I hear the Word of God come to me, before I move, the, listen to me, the Word of a prophet is subject to the prophet. The Spirit of that prophet is subject to the prophet. I never move in prophecy, tongues, or anything. If it comes to me, I, I instantly set before I move. And I run my mind through the Word of God to find out if what I'm being told lines up with this book. How do I determine it's God? By what this book says. Not by what I feel in my heart. I, 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 could, I could look at Daniel and my, my passion for him and my desire to want to see. I could run back every service and I have a word from the Lord for you. My heart's toward you. But a real word from the Lord is not spoken to my heart. It's spoken to my spirit. And then that spirit drives me to make sure it lines up with the word of God before I ever speak it. Because the enemy knows that's where deception comes from. When you close this book, folks, and you think you can still be a Christian, and you don't read it throughout the week, you'll live a life of deception. You know how many people quote scriptures or live lifestyles that they are deceived that they're going to heaven and don't have a clue they're going to hell. They're deceived. People that believe certain doctrines that can't prove, prove them in the Word of God, but they don't know the Word of God enough to try to prove them. Deception. I want to close with a text. <clears throat> if you're taking scriptures writing them down you can I'm going to close with three texts Proverbs 12 5 says the thoughts of the righteous are right but the counsels of the wicked are deceit if somebody's telling you something if somebody's trying to guide your life and they say they're a Christian they're speaking words into your life if what they are telling you does not line up with what God said they're deceiving you you're standing in front of a spirit of deception. Period. Proverbs 12, or Proverbs 20, 17 says, bread, the bread of deceit, listen to this, the bread of deceit is sweet unto a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. When it's happening, when you're being deceived, whether it's deception in relationship, deception in business, whatever you're being deceived in, it seems sweet the moment it's going on. Can I feel the Lord on It seems sweet the moment it's going on. But the end of it is like you chewing on gravels. Somebody's picked up a handful of gravels and stuck them in your mouth. The results of the deception is what you have to learn to live with. Micah 6 and verse 11 says, Shall I count them pure with the wicked with wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? Here's what Micah's saying. This is God's talking. And he's saying, I'm going to judge the people that are in deception. In order for me to call them righteous, which is my heart toward them, should I pull out a pair of balances 
that have deceitful weights to them. In other words, a 10 pound weight is really seven pounds. A five pound is really three pounds. Shall I judge them deceitful people with a pair of deceitful glasses? <coughs> just to say, just to love them and then be a part of me. And then he goes on to say, I can't do that. The balances are correct. The scale is right. What has to move is us. Thank you. God bless you. Shake each other's hand. We'll see you every Friday, Sunday morning. Don't forget next Wednesday night. Next Wednesday night starts our 35 years celebration. Listen, if you are elderly, everybody listen to me.